fantastic. Uh, are we okay? Yeah. Yeah. Are we ready for a show? Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready for a show? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the mating call of the gibbon, that, unless you're, you've got a squirrel for a mangle, that's what that is. Anyway. So good evening, folks. Welcome to my show. Uh, this is my show, by the way. I'm not some nutter who's just walked up here and and just decide, I am a nutter, but I'm an artist at a, at a festival, right? That's the way it works, really. So thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Dick Coughlin. Uh, this is my show. It's called Anti-White PC Mangina Activate. <laughs> Reasons of which will become clear, hopefully, throughout the show, right? And uh, I should point out, as you can tell, I've been doing stand-up a little while, and as you can tell, I'm running a massive fucking operation here, because... I'm the bloke who was calling time for the show down there. I'm the bloke who greeted every one of you at the fucking door. I even met some of you at the door and then was upstairs before you fucking got there. Weeding you in here. I was controlling the music and now I'm doing my own introduction to a show I've had to fucking write. So McIntyre is round the corner for me. I think Mock the Week is going to be ringing off the hook for me. Don't worry if you feel awkward at any point. If uh, this show can be a bit raw in places, don't worry about that. If you feel uncomfortable, you can leave. It's fine. I've, Listen, I, I've, I've died on my ass at some of the biggest and best clubs in the, in the country, right? I've, I've died at the comedy store. That's 600 people. So this is fuck all, right? Okay, I could, <laughs> If I work hard enough, I could fuck this up by 9 o'clock. We can all go home early, right? Okay, so we'll all be good. Also, but I want to say thank you all for coming because I have a lot of respect for the free audiences. The audiences who come... To, no, no, I do. And the reason I do... It's because you guys have come here. It's taken a lot of courage for you guys to do this. Like, like, an, like bungee jumping or parachuting or something. <laughs> because, you know, you, you've, come, you, you know, you've come to a free show and it's, it's not your fault, but you have a mindset. You come to a free show, you have a mindset. This is a free show. Probably going to be shit, isn't it? Right, this is what... <laughs> it's going to be fucking awful. But we're going to... But you could have taken the easy way out because you're at a comedy festival. You could have taken the easy way out and gone to a fancy, fancy venue that's got air conditioning and all that other high tech shit and seen a comedian who you've heard of who's on the telly, right? Okay, you could have done that and you'd probably have paid a tenner, right? And do you know what you'd have got for your ten pounds? You'd have got an hour of jokes and all of them would have been funny. <laughs> Where's the fucking fun in that? There's none, is there? Right? There's none whatsoever. So with that all said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to crack on with the show, assuming you're all warmed up. Would you please welcome with anti-white PC mangina, Dick Coughlin! <laughs> I'm going to use... The, does, is this even on? Does that make any fucking difference whatsoever? None, is it? Right. I've been doing this for 14 years. I'm not going to be like one of those new acts who goes, I want to use the mic. It's a real gig. Right? No, I'm not going to do that. Plus, people get me in the mic stand confused. So, that's why I grew the beard, sort of like throw people off over that. Or people might think I'm on stage with Russell Brand. Who the fuck needs that? Not even me. Right? So, so, we'll get on with that. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, my name's Dick Coffin. I should tell you a few more things about myself. I've been doing stand-up about 14 years, but you know you're doing stand-up for a while when you get a stand-up comedy circuit nickname. Right? And, I, and I, you know, I got one. It takes about three or four years, but I got one. I'm actually known on the circuit as the David Beckham of stand-up comedy. Bit of scepticism creeped in the room there, I noticed. <laughs> it's okay, I'll explain. It's not too obvious. It's not because I'm particularly good looking or stylish, obviously. It's not because I'm any good at football. The reason I'm called the David Beckham of stand-up comedy is because everyone who's ever met my wife really wants to smack her in the fucking mouth. <laughs> Always start with the wife beating gang. It's downhill from here on in, folks. Now, don't worry. <laughs> No, but seriously, I should actually, uh, I think the thing of this show is, that the title of this show is, 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 is something, anti-white PC mangina, is something I was called once by somebody. And it gave me the idea to do a show, really. A lot of my stuff, that this show's really about prejudices and perceptions. Our own pit to twisted perceptions on reality, really, and how it relates to pre prejudice and bigotry. Right? And, and you know, we, all make, we all make prejudice, we've all got prejudices in us, we all make assumptions about people purely based on the way we look. It's instinctive, right? You've all done it yourself. You're looking at me and you've probably made a few assumptions about me and my lifestyle and things about me. So I'm going to dispel some of the myths that are probably throwing through your head right now. I have always been a very big supporter of the government's continued war on drugs. Which is why, for the last 15 years, I've been going around my estate making sure there's none left for anyone else to come and buy. <laughs> Not even paid for it, voluntary, right? No. <laughs> People do ask me that. They, they see me on stage and they think, is he playing a character? Is he, you know, is he putting it on? Is he drunk? Is he on drugs? The answer is yes. 
Now, <laughs> you work it out. Oh, I fucking haven't. Uh, despite that first joke, that first joke, that's just a bit of a nasty joke at the start, just to set the tone, really. Because if you make it through that one, you should be okay for the rest of the show. I am actually a feminist, though. And uh, you know, I, I never used to be. I never used to be until a couple of years ago. I started going out with this girl. She was really into feminism. And uh, so I thought I'd have a go at it. And I got into it. And uh, I mean, obviously, I was better at it than she was. Um, you know. <laughs> Uh, which is why she's put up with me in the end, because they're vindictive like that, women, isn't they, when they get to the stage? That's why they need our help. You know, and, uh, there is still irony to some of that, don't worry. It's not all, it is, you know, I'm not laying it on too thick for you, because sometimes people just go, yeah, the, the women tend to laugh at that joke more, the men don't know, they're all on a date, and they're going, oh, fucking hell, should I laugh at that one? Oh, come on. <laughs> We've got, we're okay, though. And another thing about me as well that I need to uh, point out to you, uh, um, I am white. I'm sorry, I just need to, I know that people know, people, people are nervous about issues of race and stuff like that, they don't know what to, I am white, it's okay. Um, actually, I'm very white, as you can see, that's not even a fucking light effect, that is my skin colour, that pale blue. I come from Celtic origins, right, the police have their own call signal for me. When, they, when the police are looking for me, they don't go, I see one male, they say a Scottish heroin addict's ghost just walked past me, Jim. <laughs> Tom Hanks in the third act of Philadelphia has just gone by, right, I'm going, but I am very white. Not that my race has ever been in question, uh, apart from one time, right? And the reason is I've got a doctor who's a wanker, right? My doctor, he knows I do stand-up comedy, and so my doctor is always trying to get in on my act by giving me funny diagnoses for stuff. And you don't need that, do you? You need it straight to the point, right? I went there a couple of months ago. I was feeling, I was feeling under the weather. I've been ill for a couple of months and couldn't take it anymore. I went to the doctor. And he says to me, he does, he does loads of tests, scans, everything. He comes back to me and says, Richard, we've got the results. It turns out that even though you're white on the outside, on the inside, you're black. That's not how you want to find out you've got lung cancer, folks. It's a <laughs> I'm not dying, by the way, either. That's just enough. I want to make that clear, because I know I've got that look, right? People sort of like, it's a useful for getting to the front of the queue at Tesco's, but apart from all else, right? Okay, so I haven't won a competition to be here. I'm not waiting to meet John Cena. All right, this is all right. Okay, but anyway, and the thing about this show is I, I, I normally do stuff about politics and stuff, and, uh, and generally focusing on extreme ends of politics, because uh, I find that more interesting. But the thing is, it's become almost possible in this country to do satire about stuff in the, in the mainstream news um, it started a few years ago with four letters, one word, UKIP. Right? UKIP, UKIP really fucked up satire because they were impossible to satirise. You couldn't say, you would, it would just involve you coming out here, quoting something someone had said verbatim, uh, and then walking off stage. And then people like, there's no, there's no fun in that. And the point I knew when satire was dead in this country, when UKIP killed it, I was doing a gig a couple of years ago, uh, last year, doing a gig in a place called Stockton. Right, which is as northern and as awful as it sounds, okay? <laughs> Doing this gig in Stockton, and I walk past one of those grotty little working men's clubs, and they've got a poster outside advertising an upcoming UKIP fundraising event, right? And it's not that they were doing that, that's fine, they want to do that, that's their business, right? But I walk, it was the nature, I actually got a copy of the poster here, I took it down and laminated it, because I'm going to, I need you, need it, I thought you're not going to believe me unless I show you this, right? Now, given UKIP's reputation, for saying and doing certain things, right? This is possibly the most ill-conceived, misjudged idea for a fundraising event. This was a UKIP race night. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go along. I thought maybe they've got one of each. They line them up, they run them down the side of the hallway. <laughs> maybe it's code for Mandingo fighting. I don't know. <laughs> So I thought, how can I deal, how can I talk about politics in a way? And I thought, and I thought that's what I can do. You see, because for the last 12 years, I've been, uh, I've been, 12 years ago, I joined the, in I say joined the internet, I went online, for the, I went online and went on the internet, right? Now, the internet is a great place for someone like me. I mean, it's, we've got, to, I mean, one thing we've learned is that, you know, human beings are so much worse than we thought they were, weren't we? That's what the internet has shown us. <laughs> we are the worst fucking creatures on planet Earth, and the internet has shown us that tenfold. We think these people, these horrible people who harass and bully, but we think, oh, they're just sad. They're not. They're the people you... They're like football hooligans for the modern era. They're the people you work with, who wear this business suit in the day, and they go out on the internet. But it's a great place for me, 
because it combined my two favourite things, politics and nutters. Right? <laughs> and I would go, and when I joined the internet 12 years ago, there was, a, there, were these, there was a great place to go for nutters, which was chat rooms, because every different server, every different company had their own chat room. Right? You could go to different topics and stuff like that. And, and, and I, I used to go there, and they don't, they don't exist anymore. Does anyone remember chat rooms? Yeah. You remember chat rooms? For those of you who don't remember chat rooms, this is how every chat room worked. Every chat room. It didn't matter what the topic of conversation was. It could have been, what's better, mashed potato or baked potato, right? That could be the topic. And you've got team baked potato and team mashed potato I'm having a nice debate. And within half an hour, it's descended into pure racism. That's all that's <laughs> happening. Some random person will come in the room and go, you know what, fuck the Jews. And that's it, they've all kicked off. <laughs> the debate's over, that's what's going to happen, right? But I found it was a good place to sit there and find these nutters and, and fuck around with them and you know, waste a bit of time. And if you want to do it, if you want to get, get bored, I'll give you some tips, right? This is how I started off. Best place to start is with nationalists. Uh, specifically white nationalists, your BMP, your EDL types. They're the, they're the good place to start. Because um, they're very easy. They've only got one argument, which is kick them all out, right? And it's just a different variant of that. But depending on what the subject, you could talk about bin collection or recycling, and they'll they'll get it back to kick them all out, right? That's what they'll they'll do. But the best way to argue with them is don't try and have a proper argument with them. Just whatever they say, when they spit out one of their rhetorical catchphrases, just take them literally, take them at their word, right? I was having a discussion. One nationalist came into a chat room once, and he just said this thing. We've all heard this before. He said, "Fucking immigrants coming over here, stealing our jobs." We've all heard that on Christmas Day after Grandad's third sherry, haven't we? We've got <laughs> fucking immigrants coming over here, stealing our jobs. What I said to him was, actually, mate, that's never happened. Nobody has ever had their job stolen by an immigrant. There's never been one recorded incident of a bloke going to work one morning <laughs> like he has done every day for the past 10 years. He goes to clock in, his clocking in card's not there, that's a bit weird. His locker key doesn't work anymore. His picture's been taken down off the staff room wall and replaced by some strange brown fella, so he goes to see his boss. So, what's going on? He says, sorry Gary, but under the government's new Finders Keepers Losers Weepers Immigration Employment Act, <laughs> Ranjit came in five minutes before your shift and legally stole your job. I'm sorry, you could take him to a tribunal, but he's got phainites and he's touching the bin, which is home. So, <laughs> that's what you got to do, and they're fucked at that point, right? So, and if you want to get, but nationalists can get boring pretty quickly. So, what I would then do, I'd then go up to the next level. The next level up is uh, homophobes, right? Homophobes are the next level up. They're the level two boss, right? Because the thing about homophobes is great. What the reason they're more challenging is nationalists, not very imaginative, pretty, pretty dim people. They all have the same arguments. You've argued with one, you've argued with all of them. Right, they're all the same, ironically. And, um... <laughs> they are, aren't they? I mean, it's not my fucking fault. Right, but, but the homophobes are different, because the great thing about homophobes is, whereas nationalists have the same arguments each, homophobes have got their own very specific, very, very sort of like, you know, just to them, they've got their own personal reasons for hating gay people. They're very creative. You might even say flamboyant in <laughs> the way they express their hatred of gay people. It feels like they're suppressing something. I can't work it out, can you? And it also, the first time I debated a homophobe, it was the first time I ever learned about usernames, about how the username that someone chooses to go under on the internet, how that can tell you so much about a person before they've even opened their mouth. I ended up having an argument with this guy. His username was the Fag Punisher. <laughs> right? So I'm having this debate with the Fag Punisher. There's a sentence that actually makes sense to me, right? Okay? So the Fag Punisher, I engage the Fag Punisher in a debate, right? Okay? And if you've ever had a debate before, you'll know that the rule is you lead with your strongest argument. Whatever your strongest argument is, you lead with that one. Right? So you can stumble them up very quickly, end it quickly. This was the fag punisher's opening gambit to me. He says, Richard, you might support homosexuality, 
which I've never understood, by the way, as a concept or a sentence, when people say, that, do you support homosexuality? To which I say, no, I don't support homosexuality. It happens and I couldn't give a shit, right? That's, <laughs> that's not support. I, I don't know what supporting homosexuality means. I mean, if, if I see two gay guys walking down the street, I don't go, yes, get him some! Go on! <laughs> You take it up. Oh, you do? Okay, right. Okay. <laughs> but he says to me, so Richard, you might support homosexuality, but remember this. You were born out of your mum's vagina, not your dad's arsehole. <laughs> now, let's grant him that is a factually accurate statement. I'm not going to dispute that. But I was really confused by it, right? Not, I wasn't confused on it because it's a ridiculous argument. What confused me about it was the fact that he felt the need to preface this golden ingot of wisdom with the words, remember this, as if there was going to come a point in my life when for that information I would be found wanting. Like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be stumped one day. What did he envisage happening to me? Did he think I was going to be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire one day, maybe? I'm down to the million pound question, Chris Tarrant's there going, so Richard, for a million pounds, were you born out of A, your mum's vagina, or B, your dad's arsehole? And I'm going, God damn it, can I phone the fag punisher, Chris? <laughs> and just to prove my point that they've all got their individual arguments, I'll tell you one more homophobe argument I had. Uh, and, it was, and this was a bit more of a, this started off a bit more of an intelligent discussion, you know, comparatively speaking, which was, which was weird, because I could tell this guy wasn't a professional homophobe, but he wasn't a full-time homophobe. I knew that because his username was Holocaust Denier 6421 which is impressive when you think about it, because that means he had to go through 6,420 versions of that name. <laughs> before he landed on that one. So you've got to admire the man's tenacity, if nothing else. So this is gonna, so, but he's taking the time off Holocaust denial to just take part in a bit of casual gay bashing, okay? <laughs> Having a week off, you know? Yeah, we all need a holiday. And, um, yeah, so he comes up to me with an actual proper argument that actually was, you know, logically sound. He goes, listen, Richard, just because society has deemed that homosexuality is okay doesn't mean that it is. I'm like, that's very true, argument ad populum. He said, yes, because... If a society said it was okay for a full-grown man to have sex with a child, that wouldn't make it okay. I'm like, yes, but the problem is, mate, with that hypothetical, is that we live in a society where we've already deemed that it's not okay for a full-grown man to have sex with a child. So that argument doesn't really work. He went, yeah, but if we did. I'm like, yes, but we haven't. He's like, yeah, but if we did. I'm like, listen, you fucking idiot. Right? Take the helmet off, spit the applesauce out of your mouth, and get your carer to type a much better argument than this. <laughs> You've got to come up with a better hypothetical. This one doesn't work, right? The brick wall of logic has been placed firmly up here, right? So he's there for about two minutes in complete silence. He's thinking, he's thinking of something. And then suddenly he's thought of something. So he starts typing, I can tell, because it says Holocaust 9, 6, 4, 2, 1, he's typing, right? And he comes back to me, this was his argument. He goes, okay, what if my dog consented to have sex with me? <laughs> <laughs> Now, this was a text conversation. I still wrote, pardon? Right? Because... Okay, just on the off chance that he passed out and smashed his head on the keyboard and accidentally typed the stupidest fucking question anyone's ever asked. But he thought... He thought I was... He'd stump me. He thought he'd stump me. So he said, no, come on, smart-ass. What, what, what if my dog consented to have sex with me? And I said, well, mate, above all else, more than anything in the world, what that ultimately means is that you've got a talking fucking dog, for Christ's sake. I mean, why are you even asking it in the first place? That's a question. It's a bit chivalrous for a dog fucker, isn't it? And, and what are the odds that if you did ask it, not only could it understand you, but it could speak English and it was up for it as well? <laughs> I can't stand in the way of this beautiful relationship. Fucking fill your boots, mate. <laughs> But you see, now we've got the chat rooms died out because now we've got social media and Facebook and so and Tumblr and all Reddit and all these other horrible places. So uh, they sort of died out now. But uh, see, the thing is, uh, what you've got is so that's right. Twitter's an interesting one. Sorry, Twitter. Who is on Twitter? 
Mm. Yeah, one person. You got more of you on Twitter, I'm sure. Right? The thing, great thing about Twitter, right? Because when I was a kid, if you were a fan of celebrity and you wanted to say something to them, it was a fucking pain in the ass. You had to join their fan club. You had to write a letter out, buy a hand, fucking roll it up, put it in an envelope, fucking lick a stamp, go to the post box, put it there, and put the fucking uh, uh, and then you'd run downstairs with excitement every day for six months to see if you got a reply. And eventually, you'd give up and realise they're never going to get back to me. But right? Twitter takes that whole process and makes it 30 seconds long. You can say anything you want to any celebrity, and after 30 seconds, if they don't get back to you, you that's it, that's pretty much it. But sometimes, they do get back to you. Right? And I had an incident recently, I, I, I had a situation a little while ago, where I had, a very, I had someone get back to me, a celebrity, a very famous uh, female American comedian called Roseanne Barr. Have you heard of Roseanne? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course you have. Well, I hate Roseanne Barr. And... <laughs> Yeah, you know, nothing personal. You know, it's not this. I didn't like. I liked her TV show, but I just don't like her as a person. She annoys me, right? But, and Twitter, Twitter's an, an Twitter's like a drug dealer. It's always trying to fo- so, say, suggest followers. Have you thought about following this person? You ever tried something? Have you thought about? I don't want to fucking follow Roseanne. Stop suggesting, right? So I thought, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna express my, I'm gonna send out a tweet. So all caps, Twitter. I don't want to follow at Roseanne Barr. Not even if I was tied to her as she jumped off a cliff. Please stop fucking suggesting her. Roseanne got back to me within 30 seconds saying, go fuck yourself, you prick. (laughs) And finally, after 14 years of doing stand-up, I now have a celebrity quote to put on a poster. (laughs) (laughs) Who wouldn't go to that show? (laughs) And uh, the thing is, because I've been on the internet for a long time, I've been on the internet for about, like I said, 12 years, I've still got and still use my original email account that I've got from 12 years ago. And this is something I didn't notice, and I didn't know about this until I started doing this show, when I noticed there would be sniggers of derision when I told people that I, it's, I've got an AOL email account. Right? Do, do you hear that? Right? Do you hear that right there? That, that fucking, <laughs> fucking I just, it's, when did this snobbery about email addresses suddenly start? People are oh, fucking all fucking, all right, granddad, go on. Right? I feel like I've just walked into HMV and gone, have you got Hunger Games on wax cylinder by any chance? <laughs> but I've got my original AOL email account, right? And because and, and, I've had it for so long, it just, it's 99,000 9, emails a day, 99.9% of them are complete bollocks, right? It's all, it's, it's, it's mainly stuff, to, it's different things that make your penis bigger. Penis enlargement, <laughs> pe- uh, Viagra, pornography, and Saudi Arabian princes whose daughters have been kidnapped who think I'm a good middleman for the ransom. I don't know. <laughs> have they been contacting you as well? Fucking matter. Well, I got, uh, not that long ago, I got a, uh, a, a piece of spam email that, was, uh, that I, I thought was pretty brilliant. I thought it was a really good piece of spam email. This is what I consider the ultimate piece of spam email. It's from a guy, I got a screenshot of it. It's from a guy called Mohammed. He's very excited about being called Mohammed, as you can see. All caps, I don't know if that's how he introduces himself. To be what's your name? Mohammed, right? Okay. In the current political climate, that probably wouldn't be a good fucking idea. But, um, <laughs> just saying, right? But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna take an assumption here that Mohammed's first language might not be English, right? Because the email says, View penis erection, hair loss, weight, skin men. Now, <laughs> that's pretty much every spam email you're ever going to get there, isn't it? All crammed into one fucking thing. And, and it's pretty efficient, but I do think it's very hypocritical that the profit for a religion that strictly forbids pork is sending me spam. <laughs> okay, I like that joke. It's the only clean joke I'm doing. <laughs> And a lot of people, sometimes you get a few people go, you get that thing when I do that joke, because these people tend to be people who are a bit right of centre, Daily Mail readers, who have been brought up on this. And if you read the Daily Mail or the Express or the Times, and you shouldn't, right, but if you do, they'll have you believe that they'll sit there and go, if you say anything about Islam, if you make any joke or you say anything, you're immediately going to be like, you're going to be kidnapped and beheaded on the internet. This is what's <laughs> going to happen. And at the same time, they sit there and moan about it, going, no, you can't say anything about Islam or Muslims these days. If you don't say, you can't say anything about Islam or Muslims, you can't do, you can say anything about anything else, but you can't say anything about Islam and Muslims. Have you noticed the people who tell you that you cannot say anything about Islam and Muslims do fuck all but talk about Islam and Muslims <laughs> all fucking day? If, if Islam and Muslims didn't exist, these people might as well be in a fucking coma because they'd have nothing to fucking say. <laughs> And these are the people who, if, if any of those people were in here now, they, I've done that joke, they're petrified, because they would have you believe that this fucking like, big spotlight has gone up in the sky just now, with a big beard symbol in it, there's a horn going out, going, Arr! 
All the Muslims from a five mile radius are now all on their way to this venue, swinging their swords on the back of their camels, and, and coming down it, and they're going to kick that door down at any moment, fucking chop my head off, bend my decapitated corpse over this table, and then fuck me up the arse using the body of a dead baby as a condom. I don't know. I haven't read the Quran, I'm not sure if that's a literal translation, but neither of those fucking people anyway, right? But that's the thing, right? But, but just on the off chance that they're right, right, which they're not, but just on the off chance, I'm going to move away from Islam for about the next 15 minutes. I'll come back to it later, assuming I'm still alive, and then maybe I'll get to the end of the show before I die. Okay, back to the internet. Uh, the king of the internet is, uh, is Google, really. The king of the internet is Google. Google owns fucking everything. And, you know, Google is so, in you know, it's so so indelibly imbibed into our culture that there's little things that everyone, you know, we, all, we Google stuff, that's now the synonym for search engine. We don't search, we Google stuff. And there's little things you've probably all done, you know, some of you won't admit it, but who here has Googled their name? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course you are. We've all done it, right? Who here has Googled their friend's name? Yeah. With the word gay? <laughs> <laughs> or sex tape? <laughs> or both? <laughs> found something, right? well, I've been on the internet for quite a while, and as you can imagine, I've got YouTube channels, blogs, Twitters, all this other stuff, and as you can imagine, you've probably worked out, I'm someone who's made a lot of enemies, right, a lot of people have things to say about me, and um, so if you Google my name, I'm going to show you what comes up if you Google my name to save you the fucking effort, now, I've, what I've Googled is Copland616, because that's my handle on most of my uh, social media accounts, so this is what you'll get if you Google my name. Uh, Copland616, histrionicpersonalitydisorder.com. <laughs> now I don't have histrionic personality disorder, so imagine my surprise to Google my name and find out I'm on the front page of the official website. <laughs> this is a good one. Nazi to perform at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. <laughs> <laughs> this is genuinely about me, I'll read it to you. Richard Kaufman exposed as a devil worshipper and Nazi skinhead. <laughs> Nazi skinhead. I don't think. I like the fact as well he's gone devil worshipper and Nazi skinhead because <laughs> a Nazi skinhead is not a big enough character flaw. He's a devil. He's he's not even a fucking Nazi for Jesus like Hitler was. He's a Nazi for Satan. <laughs> The bottom one is just, the bottom one is a doctor in Los Angeles, Richard Kaufman, who's a proctologist, but I deal with arseholes all day long too. So, <laughs> but that's just stuff people send you on, write about you on random stuff. That's cowardly. Sometimes, sometimes you piss some people off so badly that they feel the need to fucking send you a private message, a personal email or message, just to tell you what they fucking think of you. Right, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples. This is one example. I got this on Facebook, right? It's from a guy called Jonathan Smith, so I can tell it's fake already, because that's too normal for the internet, that name, isn't it? Now, I don't know who Jonathan Smith is. I don't know what I said to annoy him. All I've got ever, I haven't heard from him since, this is what he said to me. He said, you are a fucking white son of a whore. Now, neither of those things are my fault. <laughs> Just saying, if you're going to have a problem with me, you know, the fact that my, my skin colour and the fact my mum's a slag is not a good enough reason, OK? <laughs> he then goes on, he says, if you shave the hair off of most animals' bodies, they are your skin colour. <laughs> now, I immediately went to Google News to see if there'd been a case of a bloke with a pair of hair clippers breaking into the local zoo. <laughs> Or maybe he just lined them all up, like Noah's Ark's there, he's like, eh, giraffe, donkey, yeah, it's all that. <laughs> if you shave the hair off of most animals' bodies, they are your skin colour. That is probably why your people, that's the white people in the room, right? <laughs> that's why your people love dogs and engage in bestiality, you fucking white son of a whore. Now, <laughs> it sounds to me that what Jonathan Smith is trying to tell me is that the reason people have sex with animals is that they think they look like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know whether to be flattered or offended by that, quite frankly, because it's like, I'm like, who's got such low self-esteem that they look at me and go, oh, I'd love to have sex with him. Oh, fuck it, I'm going to bomb this donkey instead. It's just like, who, who immediately goes to the animals, right? He doesn't even find someone who looks like me. That would be a star, wouldn't it? Goes straight to the fucking, you know, it's just ridiculous. But... 
But that, that, that's, that's a good one, right? But it's nothing compared to the next one. Because as you know, there's a lot of people on the internet who haven't had much of an education. And as a result of it, grammar, punctuation, spelling, these are not things that are on their agenda. Right? They've got they've got other things. So sometimes you do get some and it's just it's beyond but it's not illegible. It's not just illiterate. It's transcends it in a way it's so <laughs> fucking appallingly bad. It's like watching Les Dawson play the piano badly or Tommy Cooper fuck up a magic trick. It's it's you know, it trans it's like if a million monkeys and a million typewriters could for an infinite time period of time could not have fucked this sentence up worse than you, right? <laughs> I'm gonna show you the best piece of hate mail I've ever had. Right? I'm going to show it to you in three sections. It's four words long. <laughs> the first problem, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm respecting the fact that you're a reasonably intelligent audience because you're here and you're laughing. So, <laughs> <laughs> bloody hell, that music's loud. Anyway, so I just, I just heard the jingling in the back. So, right, so I'm going to show you the first one. You'll notice it right away, right? <laughs> Some of you are twitching, you can't. <laughs> There's going to be a mental disorder diagnosed in this country in the next five years called apostrophe RE syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Where you just fucking snap and you just fucking go. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So, your and. So we know at least one of these words is wrong. <laughs> You're an junkie. <laughs> Unnecessary capitalised first letter, Y instead of an IE. <laughs> You're an junkie <laughs> faggot. <laughs> <laughs> Going for a more European sounding fashay. <laughs> <laughs> is a four-word email. Every word is spelt incorrectly, and one of those words is A. <laughs> That's genius, isn't it? How do you fuck that up so badly? <laughs> so I want to change pace a little bit and talk about gay marriage. Right? And I don't have a link for that. The only link I could find is that the last word of that email was faggot, so now I'm going into gay marriage, right? Speaking of fashions, let's talk about gay marriage. Now, gay marriage is an interesting issue because uh, last year, America made gay marriage legal across all 50 states. Oh, and weren't they proud of themselves? Didn't they love patting themselves on the fucking back? Going, yeah, we're, we're in the image of the free world. We, we've legalised gay marriage. Something that was legal in Ukraine 17 years ago. <laughs> well done, you're really catching up with us. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> but it was weird watching it. The whole gay marriage thing's been weird because... It's like, you know, now, because America, there's a lot more focus on them than other countries, but America uh, have got this fucking weird, like, there, were, there was so many people who were like, oh, they're going to get children, they're going to recruit them. Who the fuck's going to recruit? Who wants that gig, right? You want to recruit children to it? They're gonna, the fucking ground's going to open up, meteorites are going to fall out of the sky, right? World's going to fucking end. None of that happened, surprisingly, right? But I was thinking, well, there's been countries who've had gay marriage for decades, right? Surely... They must have, like, since then, they've got over it, they've moved on. They've evolved into, like, they've now, they've now got into a point where they're dealing with other shit that we're going to have to deal with in the next 20, 30, 10, 20 years' time. So I, went on, so I went and did some research, and I was looking for which country out there has the broadest and most liberal laws, uh, interpretations, when it comes to things like marriage and sexuality, right? And the answer is Sweden. Two reasons, right? Number one, in Sweden, bestiality is legal. Now, before you all book your tickets, <laughs> <laughs> I saw some phones get out, easyjig.com, no. I need to make clear, there's some caveats to this law. Uh, there's some caveats to this law. It has to be an animal, minimum of a certain size. I don't know what that is. I didn't want to know. I just think, I'm assuming crouching is there. Right? If, if your knees are at a 90 degree angle, that is too small, right? Okay, if you have to, I don't know, right? If you can put it in a carrier bag, it's too small. Get it, right? okay. so, so it has to be an animal. To, and the animal, you can have sex with the animal, but you, the animal cannot come to any harm. Which I think is kind of weird. It's a bit discriminatory, because I figured, what if you're with a particularly kinky goat? 
who's into that whips and chains and stuff and likes being smacked around a bit, chokes a bit. That's just unfair. I just think it's weird to have a law that says it's legal for you to fuck a sheep, but if it's got a gimp mask and handcuffs on, you're going to prison. You're a, <laughs> you're a fucking weirdo, quite frankly. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so I thought that was weird. But that's only the first one. There's a second reason, right? And this is all true, by the way. I looked it up on Wikipedia, right? <laughs> You've got it, yeah. Which, so when people say I looked it up on Wikipedia, that's the modern day equivalent of what we used to say 20 years ago when we said some bloke down a pub told me. Right? <laughs> that's what we get, right? So, uh, so the other reason that Sweden's got, so you've got peace to The other reason is forget about gay marriage. In Sweden, Incest marriage is legal. Now, again, before we carry on, right? It's, uh, it doesn't, in, in parent and child can't get married, no matter how old they are, right? But cousins, half brothers and half sisters, and in some rare cases, brothers and sisters have legally been married in Sweden. Now, I don't know about you folks, but when I found that out, went straight to the top number one thing of my bucket list, number one thing to do before I die, attend an incest wedding between a brother and a sister in Sweden. I cannot think of a funnier fucking day out. Just imagine the awkwardness and the tension. I would be fucking bent. I'd have to wear a nappy. I'd be pissing myself. Staggering around all day. I don't just want to go. I want to be involved. I, want to, I, want to help. I can't imagine there's a lot of people volunteering in the family for that one. Right? I, I, want to, I mean, there's some jobs that would be quite weird. Like being the usher. It's a bit redundant, really, isn't it? Because are you with the bride or groom? I'll just sit fucking anywhere, right? <laughs> But then I want to go to the best bit's the reception, because the reception you get the speeches. Can you imagine the speeches at your incest wedding? <laughs> your groom speech. Imagine your groom speech, right? Oh, that's going to be where I remember when I first met Natalie. We were in the womb together. <laughs> Here's a scan of us after six months' time. As you, as you can see, we'd already mastered the 69 position quite well. <laughs> Mum's there cutting herself, fucking... <laughs> Dad's got a belt round his arm, going, fuck this. <laughs> the hardest job, the hardest job at your incest wedding is going to be your best man speech. That's normally the greatest job, but in your best man speech is the hardest fucking job because the whole point of the best man speech is to embarrass and humiliate the groom. It's just marrying his sister. How are you going to top that? <laughs> you can't even do a cliched best man sheep shagging joke. Why? Because you're in Sweden and it's fucking legal there. <laughs> <laughs> they probably did it the night before the wedding. It was literally a stag do, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so you think about that. Think about all those fucking uptight Christian conservative fucking idiots who were worried about gay marriage, right? Somewhere in Sweden right now, there's a bloke who's contemplating having a threesome with his sister and a pig. Right? <laughs> I'm surprised David Cameron hasn't gone over there yet, right? Okay. <laughs> but just think, then I started thinking about that. I thought, fucking a threesome with your sister, because it's three in the morning, I'm a bit pissed, my brain's unraveling. I thought, how would you even start with that as a fucking, if that was your thing you've got to do tonight, where do you begin with that? Because a threesome, you've got to have ground rules, for a three, you'd need the Geneva Convention to sort this fucking thing out, wouldn't you? Because, no, it's complicated when you think about it, because you can't just start on your sister, because the pig then will be just bored walking, what, he might just fuck off out of the room, and then you've got to stop, <laughs> drag the fucking thing back again. Right? And you can't just start on the pig, because that might offend your sister. She'll be like, oh yeah, start on the fucking barnyard animals, why don't you? Right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, so I went on the internet, Google, threesome, sister, pig, fuck off, nothing. <laughs> No one's worked this out. So I thought, I'm going to work it out. I'm going to use the wisdom of crowds theory. Right? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I've got about 8,000 people who follow me on Facebook, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get 100 of them, like in a, in a private chat, I know they, who I know have got sisters. 100 blokes who I know have got sisters. And I'm going to ask them a series of questions on the proviso that I would never tell anyone what the results were. Anyway, so. I've got these I've got these hundred blokes. So these are the questions I asked them, these are the answers they gave. Right? It was depending on what they said would determine how we would go about this, right? So the first question was, are there any circumstances under which you would have sex with your sister? Hundred people said no. Fine. Next question. Are there any circumstances 
under which you would have sex with a pig? 98 people said no. <laughs> One bloke said yes, but only if the other option was my sister. <laughs> He's kind of knack as a freeson out there. I had to fucking discount his statistics, right? But the other bloke, he didn't say yes or no. He said something much more worrying. He comes back with, well, what sort of pig is it? <laughs> I'm like, Hampshire white, fucking Vietnamese pot belly, but it's your fantasy, fill your boots, mate. I, don't really, I think you're missing the point of this fucking argument. Quite. It's like I've gone to you, would you let your granddad shit in your mouth? I don't know, I've got a wheat allergy. What did he have for dinner last night? I mean, it's like... <laughs> anyway, I'm, as you can see, I, I, I'm clearly still alive. I'm not beheaded on the internet, so we're going to go back to Islam. Now, I know you're getting nervous now, aren't you? Right? You're like, now the tension's in the room. Don't worry, you don't have to worry about it. Because you've got to talk about it, folks. Because, and you, you don't have to be scared to talk about it, because it seems it's an issue that no one knows how to deal with, isn't it? It's like nobody knows what you can say, what you can't say, and then there's people out there who just say too much. Who just say too much, and it brings, makes you feel very uncomfortable, because they're saying things that remind you of certain other things from history, and you don't want to sort of go down that road. But what the people on the far right will have you believe, the reason most people don't talk about it is because you don't know a Muslim, you don't know anything about Islam, and a bomb's never gone off within a thousand fucking miles of you, so you're just going to get on with your life. There's too many things to fucking worry about in your day. So you're not going to worry about it, okay? But there are people on the far right would have you believe that the reason we don't talk about Islam in this country is because of political correctness. Political correctness has gone mad, and when people don't want to talk about Islam, people don't want to talk about Muslims, they're too scared to say it because they're too politically correct. But what they don't realise is political correctness has actually had an effect on Islamic terrorism. It has. I'll show it to you. I'll prove it to you. Just look at the major terrorist attacks over the last 50 years. We'll start with 9-11. We all remember that. It was the day Allah went pro. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Right, OK. You'd never heard of Islam or Muslims before 9-11. Now suddenly they're everywhere. Every fucking way you go. Allah went pro. He rose up the ranks, got promoted. Right, OK? So 9-11. Now, the interesting thing about 9-11 is, is it changed the way we talk. Because if I say, I've just said 9-11, it's two numbers. You know exactly what I mean. We all know what I mean. Go anywhere in the world and say 9-11, and everyone knows what I'm saying. Even though, for every other country except America, 9-11 didn't happen for us. It was 11-9. <laughs> Wasn't it? It was 11 It weren't 9-11. It was 11-9. But we collectively, as the rest of the world, said, we'll call it 9-11, because our attitude is like, it's the Americans, they don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the world's attitude to America is that of chip parents of a spoiled child who've given up. <laughs> he wants 9-11, let him have 9-11, we don't care. <laughs> right, and that was, and that, but that resonated, because you, a few years later, you can tell that resonated in, in you know, uh, because a few years later, in London, 2005, when did they have their terrorist attack? 7th of July, 7-7. Seven, seven. They can't fuck that one up for us, can they? Uh, Doesn't matter what way round you fucking put it. So already Islamic terrorists are being more polite. <laughs> They're thinking these things through. 7-7 seven, 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 seven was an interesting one for me because I was living in London at the time of the terrorist attack, right? And, uh, and the first person to call me on 7th of July, 7-7, seven, seven, 2005, was my granddad, who, who, my granddad, who comes from Derry, right? Because my last name's Coughlin, it's an Irish name. He comes from Derry, Northern Ireland, right? He rings me up, right? He phones me up and goes, Richard, what's going on down there? I said, it's terrible, granddad. There's all these bombs going off, these terrorist attacks. He goes, he goes terrorists blown up London, Jesus Christ. How fucking 1980s is that? <laughs> <laughs> The Irish, we were blowing London up before it's fucking cool, I'll have you know. <laughs> and you, the English, you used to make fun of the Irish for being stupid. Unlike the Muslims, we worked out you have to move away from the bomb before it fucking goes off. <laughs> <laughs> My granddad, the hipster terrorist, right? <laughs> so already, right, again, but already you've got this... The resonant, you can see the terrorists are thinking about how everything else affects people. And this carried on right up until a couple of years ago when you had the Boston Marathon bombing. 
Uh, it's a bit of a weird subject for me to talk about initially because I've got a mate who lives in Boston who was actually running in the marathon. He was near the finish line when the bomb went off, right? He actually finished fourth and 15th and 27th. It was a huge explosion, right? <laughs> Let's not fall out now, right, okay? <laughs> you, di you didn't get bothered by the pig fucking stuff during the... <laughs> going to Sweden and fucking your sister, we can get through this, okay? <laughs> but no, so like, the Boston Marathon bombing, it was a weird one, and the reason it was interesting is because we didn't know who'd done it for four days until after it happened. And you could see after a while, everyone's trying to be neutral and go, oh, I wonder who did this. But after four days, you can see everyone's political agenda seeping through on both sides, right? Everyone on the far right's going, God, I hope it's a brown Muslim foreigner. God, I hope it's a brown Muslim foreigner. And everyone on the far left is going, God, I hope it's a white domestic terrorist. God, I hope it's a white domestic terrorist. Was it a white domestic terrorist? Was it a brown Muslim foreigner? Was it a brown Muslim foreigner? Was it a white domestic terrorist? It was two white Chechnyan Muslims who were naturalized American citizens. <laughs> that is political correctness gone fucking mad, folks. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. Now we don't know who we're supposed to fucking hate. <laughs> Just goes to show, when you try to please everyone, you end up fucking annoying everyone, okay? <laughs> But we don't know how to fucking talk about it. And it's not just the fact that it, it's, it's, it affects people in a way that is just, sometimes it's scary to see how, this is why people do terrorism. It works. You can see that it fucking works, right? And the best example, I'll give you one example. Now this is one example of many, but this is, this is a YouTube comment that I saw, right? And I, I don't just want to show this to you. I want to uh, submit this to the British Historical Society. I want them to put this in a time capsule. Right? So that hundreds of years from now, people can look back and realise the level of psychosis and dementia that we had reached as a society when it came to the issue of Islamic terrorism. Right? It's, a, it's by a guy called King Forty Kong. It's a bit of unpleasant racist language at the start, but, but persevere. Okay? He says, dirty packy Muslim and Eastern Europeans have ruined this once great nation. They're pretty standard internet comments so far, right? <laughs> then he goes on. There won't be many Argos stores left in future. <laughs> <laughs> They'll all be replaced by fucking mosques. <laughs> <laughs> How fucking paranoid do you have to be about Islamic terrorism? How much crack do you have to smoke the night before? To get to the point where one day you're walking down the street and you go past an Argos store and go, Won't be long now! <laughs> the end is nigh! <laughs> you won't be able to go in there soon without taking your fucking shoes off! <laughs> you're a woman, you've got to wear a beekeeper's outfit and if you're bloody in a beard down your fucking nipples. Make the most of it, people. But that's not... The, the comment itself is not the crazy part, right? It's not, it's not the horrible racism at the start. It's not the conspiratorial alarmism. It's not the fact he's getting nationalistically tumescent over an Argos store. It's the fact, what's amazing about this comment is the fact that it was posted on a fucking grumpy cat video. <laughs> and it was the top rated comment. <laughs> What was it about a fucking grumpy cat video that made this bloke think, the revolution starts here, this is... He finally gets me, this guy, right? Was he just looking at the video, was he just watching a video and went, wow, that cat looks very, very grumpy. I bet his local Argos was recently turned into a mosque. It's the only explanation, right? But that's it, that, you could dismiss that and say that's just some guy on the internet. But the thing is, there are people who we expect to take seriously, who are involved in politics, who have views that are equal to that, if not just a little one, a notch or two under. There's one guy who tried, started following me on the internet. His name's Joshua Bonehill. Is there anyone familiar with him? Is there someone you heard of him? Have you heard of Bonehill? He's fucking... He's actually in prison at the moment. He was arrested. He's a, he was arrested because he organised a Stop the Judeification of Britain march and only he turned up, right? So... <laughs> so, that, so, yeah, so that was it. But, now, there's lots of things people like to constantly try and associate and make you paranoid about Muslims. There's lots of other things. It's not just terrorism. 
Right, there's lots of things involving child sex gangs. So let's talk about that child grooming, child sex gangs, and all that other stuff, right? And not to say it doesn't happen, but they want you to be scared of all of them and think they're all going to fucking happen. And sometimes you get people who make stuff up, and they make up these stories, and, and you try, I'm trying to think, what is the point of this story? What is he getting at, right? This is an example. This is what Joshua Bonehill sent me personally on Twitter. He went, so... Serial killer Ian Huntley has converted to Islam, and we're paying for him. Now, first of all, I didn't know Islam charged, right? I didn't, <laughs> didn't know that was in there. I like the fact this guy's basically saying, I didn't mind paying for this serial killing child rapist when he was a Christian, but now I want my tax money fucking deducted out of his fucking... What is he, what's he trying to get? I don't get... Now, the thing is, Ian Huntley hasn't converted to Islam. So he's making this up. What's it? It's like some game. Darth Vader and Sauron are going to unite as one. But I don't get. What is he trying to? Ian Huntley's converted to Islam. So what? I don't know about you, but I made up my mind about Ian Huntley <laughs> when he killed those two girls. That was enough. It, oh, maybe I'm a bit narrow-minded here, but I considered that the child killing was enough information. For me to come to a conclusion about Ian Huntley, he's not a very nice man, I wouldn't go out for a pipe with him, right? <laughs> Joining Islam has not swayed the fucking dial one way. <laughs> I can't believe anyone would have read this in the newspaper and gone, Ian Huntley's joining Islam, well he's gone too fucking far now, my friend. <laughs> I'm sending my fan club membership back first thing in the fucking morning, I can tell you. <laughs> There's another guy, I'll show you one other guy. There's another guy, and he's, this guy's a bit more popular, uh, Tommy Robinson. You're familiar with Tommy Robinson, former leader of the English Defence League, recently gone to court, tried as an adult, can you believe it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but Tom, the, e the EDL were fantastic. I, I, I used to I follow them for ages, right? Because, not, not literally, but I, it was, what was funny, they came to their fucking, the first time they came to Brighton in 2010, they came, they, they, were, they were posting all these photos they were taking uh, on their Facebook page, and one of them was, look at the size of this mosque in Brighton, it was the pavilion. <laughs> Just, you've got a giant fucking turnip on top of it, they thought, it's a fucking mosque, look at the size of this bastard, right? <laughs> now, I'm talking about that, that, that that's an example, there was a case a couple of years ago, where there was a real story of a Pakistani Muslim, who was found guilty of child grooming, child sex offences, okay? And he was and not one of these Johnny come latelys like Ian Huntley, who just <laughs> kills two children and then converts to Islam to be cool. No, no, this guy, this guy did it properly, okay? So now the thing was, when this guy was arrested, he said to the police that he hated white people and wanted them all to die, right? Which is at least forthright, right? Okay, so this apparently, the fact the guy said this. Then, so he wants to kill, hates all white people, wants them to die, technically makes him a racist, I guess. So this was apparently the real issue with Tommy Robinson. He tweeted out, just when you thought you couldn't get lower than a pedo, we get racist pedos. <laughs> hashtag Islam, hashtag Pakistani, right? <laughs> if you can't see this, he's put an apostrophe on pedos. <laughs> I won't nitpick. Now, now, what Tommy's trying to say here is that because this guy is a racist pedo, that means he's lower down on the moral compass, right, the moral spectrum, than a non-racist pedo. But we, this is the thing, he's actually wrong, right? Because when you think about it, and you really all have to think about this one, folks, because I'm going out on a limb with this, right? Racist pedos are better than non-racist pedos because... If you're a racist pedo, you're only going to target children who are the same colour as you, <laughs> which means there are going to be a lot of children who are perfectly safe around you. Now that is... <laughs> I'm not saying it's a good thing in general. I don't, I don't want Pakistani children, I don't want any children to be molested, but what I'm saying is, you know, if you're a racist pedo, you, you know, there are more children are safe around you. There are less children who are likely to be targeted by you, as opposed to one of these politically correct egalitarian liberal pedos, right? <laughs> who's going to fuck anyone of any colour, regardless, because of it, it's political correctness gone mad. All I'm saying is, if we have to have pedos, and unfortunately we do, let's have racist ones. Right? That's all. <laughs> you know I'm right. You know I'm fucking right. <laughs> 
We're going to go down the nod swing of the local prison with a copy of Mind Cap and some BMP literature tomorrow. <laughs> No, you know, I like the fact that it took me, like, you've got a round of applause. That was a bit too much for that one. I don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> Laugh is fine for that joke. Round of applause makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> but there are, you know, racism is a problem, you know, particularly on the internet, and there's lots of campaigns on the internet to try and stop racism. Here's an example of one. It's called Racism Stops With Me. Now, you know when you type something into Google, you get your predictive searches of what the most... It's set up on what Google's algorithms are to what people mostly type in. And this is what has happened on this campaign. Uh, they typed in, why do black men? And it says, it's come up with predictive searches, why do black men abandon their children, beat their women, commit so many crimes, disrespect women? Right. Now, I fully support the motives and the, and the message of this campaign, but I am a skeptic, you've got to be fair, so I went on Google just to check what, what happened when I typed, why do black men, into Google. I don't know if it's something to do with the searches I put in, but when I put why do black men into Google, I got why do black men like white women and have bigger willies? <laughs> <laughs> now, that, that, that technically is racist, but let's be honest, never been a long queue of black guys willing to step up and debunk that one, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> I've always been pretty comfortable with that one, haven't they? And I don't blame them, right, quite frankly, but... But the thing is, right, I understand, right, I've got, I've, I'm totally dumb, folks, so I'm going to tell you one more thing. Uh, I understand that it's difficult these days when, you know, people do feel that political correctness has gone mad. And I do understand that there's probably people in here, you've probably been got, you know, pounced on or you've probably got in trouble for saying something that you had, you never meant it to be hateful or bigoted. You didn't mean or think you were going to offend someone. You just may be out of touch. You didn't realise, you know, it's a, that's it, that word means something different than where you've grown up. And you've now been you've now been labelled as a bigot because of it, right? It's happened to me before, and I, I understand that. It's not, no, it has, believe it or not. But, <laughs> you know, you know, but I understand that that's annoying. But what I will say to you is this: I think that's more preferable than the other end of the spectrum that we used to have, which is to a point where you're so politically incorrect that you're actually completely socially and historically unaware all the time. And I'm going to give you one example, a good example of, 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 of what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a fashion designer, a clothing store, uh, you've got one in Brighton, it's called Zara, Z-A-R-A. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course you are. Mostly the women, because they sell women's clothes. But um, they do sell children's clothes as well. Now last year, Zara introduced this new line of children's clothes. Right? Uh, and one particular item was a jumper that was for children aged three to five years old. And now I'm going to show you a picture of this jumper. Now you need to keep this in mind. This wasn't a design that was made, never manufactured and then leaked out. That could be forgivable, that's not really a story. This was not only designed, it was approved, it was manufactured en masse, it was marketed and advertised, it was fucking packed up and shipped out to all the Zara stores, it was put on the fucking shelves of every Zara across Europe and the world, and it took a customer on the first day of the sales to come in and point out what was wrong with this item of clothing. And again, I get the impression I don't need to fucking tell you exactly what's wrong uh, or why someone might be offended by this item of clothing. <laughs> this was literally a job. Now, first off, first off, they were marketing this as a French sheriff's jumper. <laughs> now that deserves a fucking rant on its own, surely? The French well-known cowboy culture there, haven't they? <laughs> but, this, but this is what they were marketing. A customer had to point out what was wrong with this. Well, I mean, I'm assuming they were. I mean, for all I know, the customer was going, those jumpers, do you do them in bulk? <laughs> <laughs> a couple of million of them, maybe? <laughs> And, and there might be one or two Holocaust historians or experts in here who want to quibble over the fact that, ah, the fucking stripes are going the wrong way in the concentration. Those stripes are going horizontally in the concentration camps. The stripes were going vertically. Yes, they were. I'm going to give them a mulligan on that one, but I think we can say it may, the, the stripes were indeed vertical in, uh, in the concentration camps, which is probably why they all look so thin in all those pictures that you see. Right, but the... <laughs> because there is a problem with anti-Semitism. Look, I'll tell you, I, I went on, you know Google Maps? You go on Google Maps, you type in something, 
and it comes up and tells you a location. Like, I went on Google Maps and I typed in Jews in London, and look, it's got them all fucking listed. <laughs> <laughs> Google telling you where the fucking Jews are all are. I don't want to, it's a bit fucking dodgy, isn't it? I don't want to. They're not salmon. We don't need to track them for migration purposes, do we? It's in London spread out a bit as well, lads. Have you seen your new mayor? Fucking get it sorted right now. But no, so you've got that. So you've got this problem with this jumper in Zara. Now, the problem is with this jumper is you could put it down to look. We all have a brain fart. We've all missed something, haven't we? We've all mi missed something that we look back and go, "How the fuck did I miss that? That was blindingly fucking obvious. I should have seen that." It's possible on an infinite timeline, seven billion people on the planet. Eventually, everyone's brain fart is going to align. The sun is in the seventh <laughs> moon of Jupiter, and it just so happened that all of the people involved in Zara, all those thousands of people, all missed it. And they didn't realise, and then they got pointed out, went, fucking hell, you're right, it does, it looks like that. But the problem with that is that Zara have, have done this before, right? A couple of years previously, Zara released this handbag. Now, you're probably looking at that, it's a bit garish, there's nothing wrong with it. If I move my hand, can you see there's a bright green swastika on this handbag? Now... When this got released, and again, this was someone else designed and made this. This was a private uh, designer, and Zara's excuse was, "Well, we didn't see the bag from the other side. We only saw one side of it in a photo." I'm like, "Well, maybe, just maybe, ask them to bring two pictures on the off chance that they fucking crocheted Rodney King being curb stomped by a Klansman on the other fucking side of the bag, <laughs> and save you a lot of PR problems in the future." Like they then got fucking, they then got sued by a Jewish and gay American who worked for them, right? and that all kicked off. But this, this all kicked off, and the president of Zara had to come out and make a public statement saying, like, you know, these things, you know, this, this, this was, we apologise for that. We're sorry for any offence. We didn't mean that. It's perfectly, you know, this, this was not intended to offend or upset anyone. Um, you know, and, and so we apologise for that. And we'll make sure it won't happen again in the future. He then finished because this was the end of the summer at the time, he finished by saying, well, you know, we do have a new range of winter clothes coming out, uh, which includes this balaclava. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making that last bit up. He never brought this out. Right? <laughs> you, can't, you cannot buy this balaclava, right? You can't. But that's it's a joke I fucking tagged on the end of this. I want to make it, I want to make it clear to everyone in here, before anyone starts thinking, I didn't make that, right? That... I, I googled the word gollywog and this fucking thing popped up and I thought I'm having that and this is a gift falling in my lap here to finish this joke. I don't know who made this, I don't know why they made it, I don't want to know why they made it. But what I do know is this, this on its own would have made the video to Lionel Richie's Hello a lot more fucking entertaining. <laughs> That's the end of the show, folks. Before I finish, before I go, um, if there is a point to this show, and normally there isn't with my shows, but this is a fucking arts festival, so you've got to have some moral at the end of the story, right? Um, uh, so I'm going to make one up, right? There is, a, there is a point to it. It's all about perception. Life is all about perception, and people are going to see what they want to see a lot of the time. A lot of people look at me and they'll see anti-white PC mangina. That's the title of the show. Some people look at me and see an junkie Faget. Some people see every animal on the planet, right? It's okay, that's <laughs> Some people look at an Argos and see a mosque waiting to be developed. Some people look at a French sheriff jumper and don't see that it's a fucking Holocaust concentration kit outfit, right? Okay, but that's, and that's really, and you can't spend your whole life worrying about, trying to make everyone happy, worrying about all that. You don't have to do that, right? I learned this the hard way. When I was, two, I started writing this show in October 2014, and um, uh, yeah, I, and I started performing it in January 2015. And on in January 2015, I had to perform this show for the first time in Manchester. I had to travel from Brighton up to Manchester, through London, through Kings Cross Station, the day after the terrorist attacks in France on the offices of Charlie Hebdo and that fucking supermarket, right? So security is amped up at King's Cross Station, it's the busiest fucking train station in Europe. Security is amped up. Now, as you can see, I've got a beard, but at the time, this thing was down to about here, okay? I, it's, it's, it's winter, so I've got a puffer jacket on, I've got my bag with all my bits in it slung over my shoulder. I'm on my way to Manchester, so I look a bit pissed off, okay? So, <laughs> I've got that classic Arab frown thing going on, right? <laughs> 
I looked so I'm expecting to get stopped by the police. I probably looked exactly like a photo fit going, look at this fucking bloke, arrest him. Right? So, and I'm not going to moan about it because I'm like, I'm like they're going to look at me and see that, but I'm not going to moan because I've got nothing on me, I've got there's nothing they can do. So they stop me, predictably. I get off the escalator, I'm the underground, they stop me. But right? they go through my bag, and they're going through my bag over here, and I'm just sort of standing waiting for him to finish. And then I turned around, and the next sound you would have heard, heard was my rectum prolapsing. <laughs> because I was greeted by the sight of a police officer going, what the fucking hell was this doing in your bag, sir? <laughs> <laughs> and there is no way, folks, you can rationally explain to a police officer why the day after a terrorist attack, you've got a beheaded gollywog A3 laminate in your fucking bag. <laughs> the next sound I heard was the rubber glove being put on in the security room. But ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the show. If you have enjoyed the show, folks, like I said, you could have gone to a big show tonight to see someone you've heard of. Uh, you could have paid about a tenner. I think this show is probably worth about a fiver. Uh, I'm going to be standing by the door to make you feel really uncomfortable if you don't want to give me anything. But if you want to put something in there, that would be great. Uh, this show has been Andy White, PC Mangina. My name is Dick Coughlin. Thank you very much for coming. Good night. Yay! Yay!